<laughs> now. <laughs> so something that we wanted to try and focus on this month was just going over the effects that faces have on people, which is adverse childhood experiences. So um, I know this is going to be kind of like a general question, but are there any experiences in your childhood that like stand out to you? Like what was your childhood like? Well, um, you know, actually, I'm glad that um, you started like that because I believe that my um, my addiction started way before I ever picked up the drug and the alcohol, you know. Um, so I was raised with a, um, a single parent, my mother. She raised um, us to the best of her ability. But she struggled with um, alcohol. And that was something that was pretty popular in um, the household. You know, I remember my grandmother, she would come over and um, she would have her little uh, wines and things like that, you know, and watching the different behaviors of people that were using um, alcohol and we not understanding that they had problems, you, you know what I mean? Um, so because of my mother's um, addiction, we were sub, uh, subjected to some behaviors from other people, uh, like molestation. Uh, we watched them, uh, domestic violence all those years, my mother being beaten, you know, they drinking and the pe the person that was causing um causing the harm to her we will watch them wake up together the next day like nothing had happened mm -hmm. you know i remember the the older guys and gals when my mother hung out with they would ask us to dance and and do all these things you know um not understanding that they were putting us already in harm's way. These were some of the things that happen in our culture and, and also, uh, what, what happens here stays here. So that was grounded. That was grounded in our heads from a really long, uh, young age. So we never would tell what things that was happening to us because we wasn't supposed to tell. And even to the point where, um, didn't tell my mother because I always thought that maybe it was my fault. You know, um, I was the reason that these things was happening to us and not knowing how, since no one never asked what happened, uh, well, we're okay or anything like that. Everything just went on as it was, you know, and it, it became normal. You know, we watch, uh, watch the drinking, the smoking, uh, the bad things that was happening to me. Um, and, and I didn't tell and nobody noticed. So we just continued to do these things. So when it came down to, um, going to school and sometimes not, not having the, um, the clothes that everybody else wore and things like that. You know, sometimes my mother, she worked two jobs and we had to stay in the house and the neighbors watched us. And, you know, it, it, it was crazy as a child, mm -hmm. you know, and this was way before the, the, um, I picked up the drugs and the alcohol, but what had happened is I realized, and this is me, I believe that, um, this addiction is a disease. However, I believe that we, uh, my mind, my brain was um, like a switch was turned on from a little kid, you know, and this is this, this, this behaviors that we had adapted to was normal. All the things that we were seeing outside, the people on the, uh, laying on the street, uh, who were addicts and, and things of that sort, you know, we seen those things and we lived in 
poverty in those areas that all this stuff was normal. When I stopped going to school and was hanging out with the older kids, I was in grammar school. They was in high school and a lot of them had graduated, but most of them had dropped out. Her stuff was all normal, you know, so um, when I first picked up my drug or when I first picked up a drink, I was in grammar school. You know, my addiction took off before high school. And because of me having a baby, I had a baby at 13. I my mother died when I was 14. Um, so me dropping out of school, going, I, I never made it to high school until I was like 16 years old, you know, so my, you know, I, and a lot of times I, I share this with a lot of the people that I talk to that a lot of high school students that, um, that is, uh, dipping and dabbing and things of that sort. And sometimes they may not have picked up the drug yet. But it's the behaviors, you know, and I believe that sometimes we need to have these honest talks with our with our youth. Mm -hmm. And I mean, sometimes that's before high school, you know, um, a lot of people that I hung out with and I use drugs and alcohol with we picked up before high school (laughs) when we were going to high school. We, you know, um, it was normal. That's what we did. We went outside and smoked and, and you know, and did what we did. As a child, I was already, I already believed that I was an addict. Um, it was nothing too hard for me to use. Um, it was normal. That's the life that um, I grew up in. Um I really didn't even know about addiction. I knew nothing about addiction. I knew that if I drank too much alcohol, I was waking up with a hangover. Mm -hmm. I knew that if I drank too much alcohol, I might not remember what happened the night before. And we laughed about it. Those, those things we laughed about, like what happened last night? (laughs) We thought, and it was, it was normal. Mm-hmm. So we had, I had some behaviors that it was normal. All this stuff was normal until I found out about addiction. But I was in it already. You know, um, as children are growing up, they are like sponges. We soak up. I soaked up so many different behaviors from the people that were around me. That means um, my mother, my grandmother, um, all the things that she were doing, you know, even having uh, being in domestic violence when when it when it came became my turn. I thought it was OK. And I thought because I fight back that it was OK. If he hit me, I hit him back. I didn't understand all those things. You know, um, I didn't understand about uh, being vulnerable, you know, because after I, everything that I have been through as a child, I, w- I didn't want to be vulnerable. I didn't want to be humble. I didn't want all those things, you know. And in order for me to uh, participate in active addiction, I had to keep all those behaviors because I, it was, I was in survival mode. You know, I never grew up. I, 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 I was just live, I was growing physically, but mentally I, w- I wasn't growing. Mm-hmm. I was just adapting to the situations that occurred. I, I knew I had to go to work. I had, I, you know, I had to have a man. Um, I knew the man needed to take care of me. I knew I knew the, uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, these were behaviors that was taught. Mm-hmm. And that was taught from a child. I watched all this stuff happen. Um, you know, my mother making decisions with the people, the company that she kept, never thinking about 
her children yeah. and how would they uh you know are they safe or you know did we even want her to be bringing all these different people in our houses you know you know her friends they became aunt mary and uncle joey and things of that sort and half of the time uncle joey and aunt susie and them they were they were causing harm to us mm -hmm. and it wasn't noticed because she trusted them where they was she trusted them so much she left it um left us open to be in harm's way. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, mm -hmm. my my addiction it definitely started way, way, way before I ever picked up the drug and the alcohol. Mm -hmm. So, because everything in your environment was so normalized growing up, what was the turning point for you where you started to learn like that recovery was an option and that this addiction that I have is not a good thing. <laughs> well, the first time I, I really uh, thought I had a problem is because I was, uh, I was dating a drug dealer and I had robbed him. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I won't say that I, I keep saying I robbed him, but the drugs was in my house. Um, and I smoked it, but uh, he beat me. Mm -hmm. And and the thing about him beating me is that I had the drugs, and I figured since he beat me, I might as well smoke, finish smoking it. You know, the insanity, the insanity. And then I decided to go into detox. And it wasn't for me, it was for him. But the insanity part is that this man had beat me and would have killed me. Um, but I had no value. I didn't value my life. I valued our relationship because he took care of me. Mm -hmm. So I went into detox at 25 years old and I realized and, and in detox, I remember the people because I drank um, alcohol and I used cocaine. I had to I had to have alcohol to even go into detox because you don't detox off of cocaine. And um everybody that was in there other than myself, they were older from one and then they was uh most of them was heroin users. Mm -hmm. So they was really sick, crying, and, and, and it was really scary for me. That's when I noticed that there was a problem with drugs. But remember, I didn't look like that. I didn't act like that. I wasn't sick like that. So I still did not realize that I had a problem mm -hmm. with the drugs. It was just the things that I was doing and the thing and the people that I hung around. So I tried to change those things, but still not really realizing that I had a problem with the drugs and the alcohol. Uh-huh. So that's that's where, you know, it got a little like I didn't understand. And also after coming, leaving detox, I remember him having my bags packed for me to go into long term. Mm -hmm. And I begged him not to send me the loan. How can somebody I'm a grown woman. Mm -hmm. It was my apartment. How, the insanity the insanity is because I was holding on to him for dear life mm -hmm. I was holding on because that's that's what I grew up around I, I saw that I saw my mother get beat and, and, and her boyfriends come home and, and give her pay her mom, their money after working all week and they sat there and drank it all I seen all of that mm -hmm. So, so that was kind of crazy for me, but I believe that I needed him. And in order for me to stay on the right track, I needed to have this man in my life. No, not, not to mention he was my dealer. 
That's how we met. But I didn't know any better, you know. I knew that I didn't like, I, and he was the first dealer I went with because I didn't think I knew what dealers did and how they used women on the street that were what they called us crackheads. Yeah. You know, so I never wanted to be that person. I never wanted anybody to uh, call me those things. So I worked a lot. I stayed in the house. I hid my addiction for most part, you know, and that's how that happened because I was, he didn't know that I was using. So once I took a hit in my house, all bets was off, you know, so. <laughs> So that's how that happened, you know. <laughs> One is too much, a thousand, uh, thousands, is too, whatever that is. But I didn't know that then until after. But the insanity part of this disease of addiction is the things that we believe um, the, the the drugs and the alcohol have us believe, you know, um, I needed this person, this person, you know, he's saving my life. Are you for real, Ruby? But I went through all of that, you know, and I ended up marrying him. Mm -hmm. So um, I went through that, but it didn't keep me clean. So I used again. I I was one of these people that I never it, it, it didn't matter drugs alcohol whatever I was after uh, going into detox I was never that person that would get high every day mm. I, I could get high once a year and be fine <laughs> so that also made me believe that I didn't have a problem and I, I, you know, I, I, I live the normal life. I travel. I, I, I like nice cars. I like to, to do things. You know, I had great jobs. Um, I, I'm a foster parent. I, I'm a correctional officer. <laughs> you know, uh, I ran two private, private businesses. I, I did all those things through an act of addiction and did not know that I really had a problem. And what I was doing was substituting the drugs for work mm -hmm. you know the uh the jobs and 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 all the stuff that i was doing i did all those things so i wouldn't get high you know i didn't believe i didn't understand that i was still an active addict yeah you know and um at the end i i um I have seven years clean and I remember, um, I had a bad accident, really bad accident. And, um, I ran my car into the divider on 80. And when I went to retrieve the car, they said that, um, they showed me the car and I said, this couldn't possibly be my car because looking at the car, whomever was in that car, definitely can't couldn't be still alive and here i stand and um and i had no scratches no bruises or anything on me so that couldn't possibly be my car but i know today the god of my understanding has saved my life and i had another chance at life and to live a normal life and I called someone in recovery, which was my twin sister. And I told her I need help. And that time I surrendered to this disease of addiction. And that's when my journey began. So I first time I was in recovery was at the first time I went to detox. I was 25. But when I came back, I was 50. And now 57. And I got a birthday coming. And guess what? I'm celebrating birthdays today clean. Wow. Never wanted to celebrate a birthday clean. How boring is that? <laughs> and today I'm, I'm, I'm excited, you know, I'm excited to, um, to be still here getting a, uh, my birthday is the 20th. Like, wow, I'm excited. 
I'm I'm excited. I thought before that 58 was so old and like, what would I be doing at 58? <laughs> so that's old people. <laughs> But I'm so I'm, I'm so thankful for recovery. I'm so thankful for alumni and recovery. You know, um, meeting Nancy, she changed my life uh, in so many different ways. You know, um, one thing I love about Nancy is the things that she stands for. You know, um, I'm I'm still a a person in long-term recovery. I have so many flaws um, and to and so much work to do, so much learning, you know, and I'm so open. And it's things like, you know, even Nancy with her little spiritual uh, inspirational quotes and things like that. That's such a um, inspiring to me, you know, the, uh, going into the schools and letting people know that um, they can recover, you know, because in, as a teenager in high school, first of all, we don't believe that. No, them crackheads, those, excuse me, those dope fees, and that's them. That's not us. Not absolutely not. <laughs> We're just having a good old time. Who the who would have thought at high school that I would be sitting in a on I just I just got off another meeting uh uh in a meeting right <laughs> this is my life who would have thought <laughs> you know and this is what it's about but guess what I believe and my sponsor told me this in the early recovery everything that I had ever went through in my life was for somebody else. And I was kind of hurt because I could not believe the God of my understanding would put me through all that. I had a baby at 13, molested at four. Um, my mother died at 14, uh, homeless at 15, domestic violence by 16. The list just goes on and on. And the God of my understanding would put me through all that for somebody else. I went through all of that so I could still stand and he kept me so I can sit here today and share my experience, strength and hope with someone else that they know that them too can recover. Thank you. It's nice talking to you today. We're out of time now. So is there any last thing you'd like to say before we end off? We are free. We are free. Let's go out and live our lives and continue to share recovery with the world. Thank you, Ruby. Bye-bye.